Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. My apologies uh, for my uh, voice this morning, a bit of laryngitis, but we'll continue as best we can. Continuing our reading and discussion of this most important little booklet entitled The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. This author, uh, Owens, Paul Owen, is setting forth the historical record that the Roman Catholic Church is the one who invented both preterism and futurism. Preterism and futurism are alternative interpretations of Bible prophecy that have a common purpose. Though they contradict one another in almost every detail, they have one purpose, and that is to exonerate the papacy from the accusation of being the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist of the Bible, the little horn of Daniel. Okay? And preterism accomplishes this by placing Antichrist of the Bible back into the old pagan Roman Empire, that it was either Nero or Caligula or Domitian or one of the ancient Roman Caesars that ruled in Rome subsequent to uh, the crucifixion of Christ, that Antichrist has already come, that Antichrist has already been done away with, and now the papacy is to be the leader of the Christian world. He is, as it were, Christ on earth, and the vicar of Christ, the replacement of the Son of God on earth, that the kingdom of heaven... The kingdom of Christ is vested in the Roman Catholic Church and only the Roman Catholic Church, and it is the papacy's divine right to be the king of kings and the lord of lords and to make every human creature a subject of the Roman pontiff, and that there is no salvation outside the Roman Catholic Church, no salvation outside of the papal authority. He holds the keys of heaven and hell. He is, as it were, God on earth. And he has a divine right, according to Roman Catholic canon law, to use whatever whatever means, fair or foul, to bring this world into subjection to himself as though he were Christ on earth. That's what preterism accomplishes. It makes Antichrist a figment of the long-forgotten past. And it puts the papacy, and only the papacy, as king of kings and lord of lords. Christ's throne on earth. That's what preterism does. Now, we're going to re- retreat since, since uh, we're just coming back from the weekend. And we'll begin on page 12 of this book where it says, The Papal Origins of Preterism. This is... The, the, the author's explanation of the origins of this preterist belief, this, this preterist interpretation of Bible prophecy. He says, to lay further questions and objections to rest, in other words, the accusation that the papacy is the Antichrist, another school of interpretation was developed. So just how and when did the preterist school of prof, uh, prophetic interpretation begin? Dr. Henry Grattan Guinness, in his book, The Approaching End of the Age, answers that thought-provoking question with this observation, quote, The first, or preterist scheme, scheme, considers these prophecies to have been fulfilled in the downfall of the Jewish nation and the old Roman Empire, limiting their range thus to the first six centuries of the Christian era and making Nero the Antichrist. This scheme originated with the Jesuit Alcazar toward the end of the 16th century, and I have pointed out this is right after the Council of Trent. It has been held and taught under various modifications by Grotius, Hammond, Bossuet, Eichhorn, and other German commentators, Moses Stewart, and Dr. Davidson. It has few supporters now, says the author, and need not be described more at length. So Henry Grattan Guinness says that preterism 
was uh, an age-old belief and teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It was expounded on by many uh, preterist authors and historians and German commentators and German commentators. And Germany was Roman Catholic. Okay, So these Roman Catholic teachings, which exonerate the papacy and place the the, the blame for Antichrist upon one of the old pagan Roman emperors thus accomplishes two things. It puts Antichrist in the past and leaves the door open for the papacy to be Christ on earth. Okay, This is the justification, though it is not overtly stated in the Roman Catholic Church. This is the belief that the papacy is the literal return of Jesus Christ. Okay? The book of Revelation re- prophesies the return of Christ. And the, 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 the New Testament prophesies the return of Christ. And so if the papacy can place Antichrist in the old pagan Roman Empire that it replaced, that the papacy replaced, then the papacy can see itself and expect the whole world to see that Christ returned to the earth in the form of the papacy. Okay, This is the justification that the popes had of gruesomely torturing and murdering anyone who rejected the authority of the papacy. We've talked about the persecution of the Waldenses and the Albigenses and the Huguenots, and the Hussites, and all the true Protestants throughout history. They died. Their blood was shed by the papacy because, number one, they would not accept him as Christ's personification on the earth. But they wouldn't wouldn't obey him, and they preached against him. Now, what does the Scripture plainly say? And my sheep will hear my voice, and they won't follow another. Okay? The papacy is that other shepherd, that false shepherd. And all the Christians throughout history who knew their Bibles and understood rejected the false shepherd in Rome. And for that, they lost their lives. The papacy literally made a career out of killing those who rejected his authority, who refrained from listening to his voice. That's the whole history of of the church age up to this point. Those who reject the voice of the papacy, who reject his pretended authority, who protest against him, are subject to the persecution leveled against them from the papacy and carried out by the civil governments of the world. Okay. Now, he says, notice that Dr. Guinness mentions that preterism had few supporters in 1887. However, today it is enjoying resurgence and is the view held by many in the Reformed faith. Now, he explained this earlier. Why was preterism not given any credence before? Because the interpreters of the Scriptures plainly understood what Paul said. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then that man of sin shall be revealed. So the man of sin could not be revealed in the world until a restrainer, someone who was restraining his rise to power, had to be taken out of the way. And that power was then and ruling at the time Paul spoke. Now that can be none other than the Caesars of the Roman Empire. And when they were taken out of the way, that man of sin was revealed. And we know that this is speaking of the Caesars because of what later happened, that the papacy, which replaced the Caesars, that stood up in the power vacuum left behind by the Caesars, the first thing he did was to fulfill another prophecy of Daniel, the prophecy of the little horn who stood up and uprooted three kings. These were the Gothic kings that the papacy overthrew 
and destroyed and eliminated even from history. The Visigoth, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, and the Heruli. Okay, they were three kings that rose up and competed with the papacy for control of the Roman Empire. And the papacy destroyed them. Okay, so we have a positive identification, a scriptural identification, a prophetic identification, a positive identification of who that man of sin is. It is, it was, and it always will be the papacy because no other power has fulfilled the prophecies of God like the papacy. All right? So preterism was not believed. It didn't have any credibility because God's people understood the Scripture, which clearly identified the Caesars as the restrainers that Paul spoke about. And the Scripture plainly identified the papacy and only the papacy as that little king, that little horn that stood up among ten kings the ten nations that, that, that became apparent after the fall of the Caesars, the Roman Empire broke up into ten kingdoms, then the papacy stood up and eliminated those three. Okay? So we cannot have an Antichrist that comes during the reign of the pagan Roman Caesars. It must come up after the fall of the Roman Caesars. And we have two witnesses in the Scriptures. By two or three witnesses, let everything be established. That's for our admonition. And we have those two witnesses, Daniel and Paul, and even a third, John the Revelator. Okay? John was imprisoned under the hand of this pagan Roman Caesars. Okay? And when they were taken out of the way, then that man of sin would be revealed. Okay, it's called the book of Revelation. It reveals who the Antichrist is, and thereby it reveals who the true Christ is. <clears throat> okay, so Henry Grattan Guinness rightly says that preterism had few supporters in 1887. However, today, now listen, here's another point I need to make about this. The Protestant Reformation had already been... Uh, 300 years old. Okay, this is 1887 he's talking about. Protestantism got an official start at 1517, although it never really started. It was the true belief of all Christians throughout history. Protestantism, as I've mentioned many times, I hate to repeat myself so often, but preterism, or rather uh, uh, Protestantism, was simply marked by that period of time when a vast majority of Catholics came to understand that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. That's what, that's what motivated Martin Luther. The, 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 the final comprehension that the leader of his church was the Antichrist. The papacy was the Antichrist, and that's why he came out of the Roman Catholic Church to protest. Read the scriptures... He saw that the Roman Catholic Church fulfilled those prophecies, and he came out in protest. He condemned the papacy as the Antichrist, and that marks Protestantism, which was not at all new in the world. It was the orthodox teaching of true Bible-believing Christians, always and forever. And so in 1887, preterism was dismissed as a fraud it wasn't even worthy of discussion because protestantism had had 300 years to grow and the common knowledge understanding that the papacy is the antichrist which came after the caesars just as paul predicted just as daniel predicted and just as john revealed so preterism had no clout preterism had no no acknowledgement okay but he said, however, today, okay, today it is enjoying resurgence and is the view held by many of the Protestant Reformed faith. Why is that? Because, as we've explained before, 
Futurism identifies a future single individual as the Antichrist, way off in the distant future. But before he comes, there has to be sacrifices made in, the, in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. That necessitates that a modern nation state of Israel be created. It was in 1948 that there be Jews living in the land as because of, that, of, of, of the First and Second World Wars and the persecution of the Jews and the making of a homeland in their ancient Jewish state was made and they were forced to go down there through persecution. So the papacy accomplished those two things. Okay? Now, they, in, since 1967, they have possession of their ancient capital, Jerusalem. Now all there is left to do is to build a temple or to begin animal sacrifices again on that temple mount in Jerusalem so that they can dummy up a future phony 70th week of Daniel so that they can present to the world another Christ that intended to be the papacy. Well, the trouble with futurists is Things just aren't going according to Hoyle. Things just aren't progressing the way they should. And many futurists are beginning to be uncomfortable. Is this God doing this? If, if, if so, then why is it taking so long? Why have we not been raptured out? Why are not the Jews offering sacrifices? Where is this seven-year peace treaty that is supposed to let the, the sacrifices and oblations begin, where is this temple, where's the priesthood, where's the Ark of the Covenant? Things just aren't going according to plan. It's all because God has thrown a monkey wrench into this. He's plainly telling the world, there is no future fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. My son fulfilled it 2,000 years ago. Believe on him. Okay? And that also means the papacy is the Antichrist, and the papacy is behind this phony futurist fulfillment of, of the 70th week of Daniel. And uh, pr uh, futurists are becoming restless in their belief. And so rather than to return to the true biblical, historical, and prophetic uh, truth, the historicist truth that sees the papacy as the Antichrist they're jumping out of the futurist frying pan and into the preterist fire. They're beginning to agree with the preterist that, well, it must have been one of the ancient Roman Caesars. And so they've, they've left one school of Bible prophecy that exonerates the papacy, futurism, to preterism, which does the same thing. It exonerates the papacy of the onus of Antichrist. So they're not learning anything. They're just demonstrating how foolish they are. Okay? He says, notice that Dr. Guinness mentions that preterism had few supporters in 1887. However, today it is enjoying resurgence and is the view held by many of the Reformed faith. Those of the preterist school of interpretation should take special note of Dr. Guinness's statement taken from page 113 of Romanism and the Reformation. Here's the quote. Some writers assert that the predictions pointed back to Nero. This did not take into account the obvious fact that the Antichrist power predicted was to succeed the fall of the Caesars and develop among the Gothic nations. Okay, there's your quote from Henry Grattan Guinness. What? Biblical truth makes preterism an impossibility. Daniel and Paul. Daniel identified the man of sin, the little horn, who uprooted three kings, and this happened in history only after the fall of the Caesars. But the Antichrist would destroy three kings, and this could only have happened after the fall of the Caesars. It took place among the Gothic nations that wrestled for power of the ancient Roman Empire 
after the Caesars got out of Dodge. So preterism on its face falls flat on its face. The scriptures make preterism a lie, a confirmed lie. No futurist, once he gets uncomfortable with his futurist belief, has any solace or has any refuge or any hope whatsoever in preterism. Preterism is a proved lie. It has been proven to be a lie. And in its heyday, when it had the most sway, very few people believed in it. So they've left their futurist home for another, you know, cesspool. Okay. Now, this is where we concluded Friday. I hope this is sinking in to my listeners. Now, Leroy Froome, in his book, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 2, confirms the foregoing facts of history. Quote, Rome's answer to the Protestant Reformation. i, I got to remind the listeners, what was the Protestant Reformation? Well, that was when Roman Catholics became aware that the papacy is, was and always will be the, the Antichrist. Okay, they, they, They're beginning to believe and agree with all Bible-believing Christians throughout history that marked, positively marked, unequivocally marked, unmistakably marked the papacy as the Antichrist of the Bible. Roman Catholics in Roman Catholic Europe all of a sudden read the Scriptures for themselves and perfectly understood that the role the papacy was playing in the world had to be the Antichrist of the Bible. Okay? So Rome had to give an answer to these wayward heretical and obstinate heretics who have left the Roman Catholic Church calling the Pope the Antichrist. He says Rome's answer to the Protestant Reformation was twofold, though actually conflicting, conflicting and contradictory. Okay? You, we have to understand that preterism and futurism are conflicting lies. They oppose, well, you can't be a preterist and a futurist at the same time. They're mutually exclusive. You can be a futurist or you can be a preterist, but you can't be both. And this is, goes back to the analogy that I gave before. Little Johnny, who was told to stay out of the cookie jar, all of a sudden mom and dad discovered there are cookies missing from the cookie jar, and Johnny get, tells two lies in explanation. Well, I could not have stolen the cookies because I was in the shower. Well, Mom goes upstairs in the shower and finds out that the shower floor is dry. There are no wet towels in the hamper. So she approaches Johnny and says, Son, the shower's dry. Did you dry the shower when you got done taking a shower? Oh, I made a mistake, Mom. I wasn't in the shower. I was down to little Jimmy's house. I couldn't have taken the cookies. So Dad calls up little Jimmy's father to find out uh, if Johnny was down there. And turns out nobody's home at Jimmy's house. He consults a, a, a neighbor and says that Jimmy and his family have been away on vacation for two weeks. Johnny could not have been at their house. So both parents get together with Johnny standing between them with cookie crumbs all over his face face and chocolate chips in his teeth and they're arguing back and forth about which alibi Johnny gave is correct. Mom and dad are fighting and seeking to exonerate Johnny. That's what preterism and futurism does. And Johnny created both lies. Makes sense, doesn't it? We'll be back right after this. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. 
and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month, and you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25, or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do Internet? Then call 559-781-3773 and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support this program, Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors it. And if you'd like to contact me, please do so by email. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. The website is inquisitionupdate.org. Now, I hope you're enjoying my analogy There's little Johnny standing right there between mom and dad. Mom and dad are arguing back and forth. Whose alibi is correct? Should we believe the one mom believes? Or should we believe the one dad believes? Johnny is rooting for both of them. Johnny is sheepishly rooting for both of them. Because if they ever give up their ridiculousness, they're going to return to the truth. It's a perfect analogy for what takes place between preterists and futurists. First the preterists had sway, then the futurists had sway, and there stands little Johnny between the both. And he authored both of those lies. Okay? It's the papacy. In return to historicism, all of a sudden, all the difficulties go away. The culprit is known. The author of preterism and futurism is a common author. It is the papacy. Okay? It's the papacy who has cookie crumbs all over his face and chocolate chips in his teeth. And it makes no sense for mom to argue with dad or dad to argue with mom trying to decide which one of Jimmy's lies we're going to believe when both are provably absurd. That's the analogy. That's preterism and futurism. They are mutually exclusive and they themselves identify who the author of these lies are. The papacy. They are conflicting and contradictory lies, preterism and futurism, and they have a common goal, a common objective. Though they differ completely, they differ diametrically, they have a common goal, and that is to exonerate the papacy. Now, he says, through the Jesuits' right the Jesuits, Ribera and, uh, of Salamanca, Spain, and Bellarmine, both Jesuits of Rome, 
the papacy put forth her futurist interpretation. And through Alcazar, Spanish Jesuit of Seville, she, that is the Roman Catholic Church, advanced almost simultaneously the conflicting preterist interpretation. These were designed to meet and overwhelm the historicist interpretation of the Protestants. Okay? Let me read it again. Rome's answer to the Protestant Reformation, that is the universal recognition the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, was twofold, though actually conflicting and contradictory. Through the Jesuits Ribera of Salamanca, Spain, and Robert Bellarmine of Rome, the papacy put forth her futurist interpretation. And through Alcazar, Spanish Jesuit of Seville, he advanced almost simultaneously, that is, right after the Council of Trent, the conflicting preterist interpretation. These were designed to meet and overwhelm the historicist, that is, the Protestant interpretation of Bible prophecy. Though mutually exclusive, either Jesuit alternative suited the great objective equally well, as both thrust aside the application of the prophecies from the existing Church of Rome. Okay? Pick whatever lie you want to believe. You want to believe the shower? You want to believe Jimmy's house? Go ahead. Okay? If you want to believe preterism or futurism, go right ahead. You've exonerated the papacy. Okay? And no mention is ever made of historicism. It's not even an offered third alternative. The whole world is caught between the preterist and the futurist lie. And historicism has long been forgotten. The truth has been long since forgotten. That which was believed by Bible-believing Christians from the first century right up until the Council of Trent and beyond. I'm a historicist. I have abandoned both preterism and futurism. I now have a competent recollection of the scriptures, a competent recollection of history, and I have no more conflict. When I read the Bible, I know what prophecies have been fulfilled in history and which are yet to be fulfilled in the future. I know who the Antichrist is. I don't even doubt it. And no one could dissuade me from my belief. There have been 1,800 years of proof, rec rec recorded historical proof, proving beyond any question who the Antichrist is in the world. And of course, that is not an enviable position to be in when you're surrounded on every side by those who are engaged in an argument, whether preterist or futurist, and they love their delusion. They repeat their lies ad nauseum. They gleefully accept anyone else who will come among them and repeat those lies along with them. But if you stand up among them, and tell the truth, preterism, be, the preterists and the futurists together will seek your demise. They cannot and will not accept their error and conform to historicism. Okay? You find yourself in this historicist belief with very, very precious few friends and nothing but bitter mortal enemies those who wish to silence your voice. Okay? So we have the preterists and the futurists. The futurists are becoming uncomfortable with the preterist interp or the futurist interpretation. Things are not just going like they should. The rapture hasn't happened yet. There isn't a temple built. There's no animal sacrifices. And uh, uh, no seven-year... A peace treaty with the Jews 
And it looks like uh, maybe there's something wrong with this futurist understanding. Maybe I better return to the preterist understanding. And then, likewise, the preterists who begin to read their Bible find out that the Caesars were the restrainers, and the papacy was the one that raised up in the Gothic nations, abandon their preterist view, and they, they bail off into the futurist uh, uh, frying pan. So they're bouncing back and forth between preterism and futurism and skipping completely over historicism. And if a historicist stands up in the, in the gap between the two, they both want to turn. This is how the Jesuits have, have split up God's house and have actually made Catholics out of Christians. They've given them Catholic beliefs. And so whether they know it or not, or believe it or not, they're actually allies of the papacy. It's like I've said so many times, especially in my discussions on amateur radio, when the Inquisition comes to the United States of America, and I say it's already beginning, who will be the ones lighting the auto de fe fires to burn the heretics at the stake? Rome won't have to do it. He'll have preterists and futurists that will do it. Anyone who stands up <clears throat> with the biblical, historical, and prophetic truth and pronounces historicism as the only believable, the only provable interpretation of Bible prophecy, the preterists and the futurists will be ready to burn you at the stake. And Rome can just stand back aloof with hands raised up in the air. I have nothing to do with this. I have nothing to do with this. It'll be Protestants and evangelicals who are persecuting the saints. Rome has actually recruited Protestants to burn Protestants, to persecute, to do her bidding. Now, in the old world order, that wasn't necessary. The papacy had control of the kings of the earth, the papacy could issue the order, exterminate the heretics out of your realm. And if not, you will be excommunicated from the church and denied salvation. So the kings of the earth went and rounded up all the Bible believers and all their Bibles and burnt them all. And Rome got the credit. Rome got the booty. Rome got the property. Split it with the king that did the that did the Inquisition against God's people, and uh, this is the this is this became so obvious that the Roman Catholic Church began to suffer in popularity because of it. Okay, people began more and more to believe that there's nothing holy about the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and so it was doing more damage than good to go around and burn heretics. Well, look at the situation now. The persecution doesn't have to come from Roman Catholics. It can come from Protestants. That's right. Those who call themselves Protestants but are Catholic in their belief. This is, this is, the, this is how insidious this Inquisition is going to be in the United States. And when they kill you, they are going to think they're doing God's service. But whose service are they doing? The Pope's. That's whose bidding they're going to be doing. And this is top secret. This is one of the closest held secrets of the Vatican today. That she has recruited Protestants with lies to do her bidding against historicists. Now we have the futurists, we have the preterists. It was through Alcazar, the Jesuit priest, the Spanish Jesuit priest from Seville, who advanced the preterist interpretation. We have Ribera and Bellarmine, who advanced the futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy. And these were both designed to meet and overwhelm the historicist or the Protestant interpretation of Bible prophecy. Though mutually exclusive, either Jesuit alternative suited the great objective equally well, as both thrust aside the application of the prophecies 
from the existing Church of Rome. The one accomplished it by making prophecy stop altogether short of the papacy's career. The other achieved it by making it overleap the immense era of papal dominance that is the entire church age and crowding the Antichrist into a very small fragment of time in the still distant future just before the great consummation. It is consequently often called the gap theory. Okay, the gap theory. I want to give credit right now to Nicholas Arthur on Cross the Border, who did a video some years back. And you can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it on his uh, website. And uh, if he'll put it up on my website, he can, he's more than welcome to. It's entitled, Where is the Gap, Chuck? Where's the Gap, Chuck? And what he's doing is exposing Chuck Missler as a futurist liar. I, I applaud him for his work and as very valuable information for my listeners. Where's the gap, Chuck? There is no gap between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy, just as much as there is no gap between the 7th week and the 8th week of Daniel's prophecy. They are consecutive, they are uninterrupted, and when the 69th week ended, the very next day, the 70th week of Daniel began, and it began with the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ by John the Baptist. And there was a seven-year period of time, a countdown from that moment, seven years later, Daniel's prophecy would be fulfilled, the end of a 490-year prophecy. The 70th and final week began with Jesus' baptism. He was baptized. He was tempted of the devil. And then in the midst of that 70th and final week, after three and a half years, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life. He reconciled us to God. He made reconciliation for iniquity. He brought sin to an end. Okay? And for the remainder of that three and a half years, of that remainder of that seven-year period of time, the gospel continued to go to the Jews and to Jerusalem through the Spirit-filled, those who were filled with the Spirit of Christ until the, the end of that 70th and final week and then the gospel went to the Gentiles, and the house of Cornelius was fulfilled, was, was saved. So there's no mistake. Jesus is the 70th week of Daniel. Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel. Daniel prophesied the precise historical coming of Jesus Christ. He predicted the calendar date that he would be baptized in the River Jordan. You count them, 69 weeks of years after the going forth of the command to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem, the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks, which is 69 weeks altogether, and then there's one week left. That is the Messianic week. There's no gap between the 69th and the 70th week of Daniel. They are consecutive concurrent but Rome preaches a gap theory. Rome wants us all to believe a gap theory. And if we won't believe the gap theory, we have the preterist theory we can believe in if we want. But only the Scriptures reveal the truth. Only history reveals the truth. And there is no contradiction between Scripture and history. We don't fear that somehow our interpretation, our historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy can be wrong. We don't fear that. We only fear being persecuted by those who claim to be God's people, who have believed lies all their lives. So go to Nicholas's website, cross the border, and 
go to his video series entitled, Where's the Gap, Chuck? And listen to what he says. And you'll find it very complimentary and very agreeable with what I say here on first on uh, Inquisition Update. Now, concerning these two alternatives, preterism and futurism, presented by Rivera and Alcazar, both Jesuit priests, right after the Council of Trent, consigning Antichrist either to the remote past or the distant future, Joseph Tanner, the Protestant writer, gives this record. Listen to what Tanner says. We've heard what Henry Grattan Guinness said. Listen to what Tanner says. <clears throat> Accordingly, toward the close of the century of the Reformation, that is at the end of the 1500s, right after the Council of Trent, two of her most learned doctors set themselves to the task, each endeavoring by different means to accomplish the same end. Namely, that of diverting men's minds from perceiving the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Antichrist in the papal system. The Jesuit Alcazar devoted himself to bringing into prominence the preterist method of interpretation, which we've already briefly noticed, and thus endeavored to show that the prophecies of Antichrist were fulfilled before the popes ever ruled at Rome and therefore could not apply to the papacy. On the other hand, the Jesuit Ribera tried to set aside the application of these prophecies uh, to the papal power by bringing out the futurist system, which asserts that these prophecies refer properly not to the career of the papacy, but to that of some future supernatural individual who is yet to appear and to continue in power for three and a half years. Thus, as Alford says, the Jesuit Ribera of A.D. 1580 may be regarded as the founder of the futurist system of modern times. Unquote. Pretty convincing, isn't it? And not only convincing in logic, but it is evident in history. Oh, so evident in history. When God prophesies something, you can only expect to find its fulfillment in history. Now, if you want to promote a prophetic lie, all you have to do is make a prophecy that cannot be fulfilled until the very end of time. And that assures that anyone who believes that futurist lie can never prove it wrong. How convenient for the futurist lie. It cannot be pro proven wrong because it has not yet been fulfilled in history. I got news for you. It never will be fulfilled in history. Because the futurist lie, as taught in the Protestant churches, literally was fulfilled 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ. And they failed to see it in history. They failed to see that Daniel was not speaking of a future Antichrist and a future seven-year period of time and a future covenant with the Jews and a rebuilt temple with animal sacrifices. He was talking about Jesus Christ. Not one word in Daniel's 70-week prophecy is making any reference whatsoever to the Antichrist. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about our Messiah and the most reliable history book on the planet, the New Testament, or the Bible altogether, but particularly when dealing with Daniel's prophecy, we regard the New Testament the four Gospels, as the historical record, the, in, the inerrant historical record of the perfect and complete fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in Jesus Christ the Messiah. That is how you expose the, the futurist lie that cannot be proved to be a false prophecy 
until you understand that that prophecy has be, already been fulfilled in history. That's how you defeat uh, futurism. You have to prove beyond any doubt that Jesus fulfilled that futurist 70th week of Daniel 2,000 years ago. That's how God liberated me from the lie of futurism. Showed me the historical fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy 2,000 years ago. Perfectly and completely. And he did it after 50 years of futurist indoctrination. He did it in such a way that is to be so unlikely that I cannot take credit for it. I can only give credit to Christ. He did it after 50, after 50 years of indoctrination in the futurist churches. I came to the historical understanding kicking and screaming because it conflicted with everything that I was taught in my church that I loved and my pastor that I loved. And both sides of my family, from my father's side and from my mother's side, they were all futurists. I'd never heard the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy. And over the next 20 years, God made it more perfectly understandable to me. And now I find myself nearly alone. And I know, when I was there at work all by myself, reading the Scriptures, reading Daniel's prophecy, that had it not been for the mercy of God, I would have read Daniel's prophecy just like I, would be, I had been taught it in the churches. It's the only way I've ever been able to understand Daniel's prophecy but how the churches taught it to me. And that night, alone at work, all by myself, with just me and the Scriptures, all of a sudden, God made me to understand that Jesus fulfilled that prophecy perfectly and completely 2,000 years ago, and that the churches were all wrong. And now I know why they're wrong, and who sold them the lie. The man of sin, son of perdition the little horn, the false of kings and lord of lords, the Antichrist, the papacy. That's when I came out of the churches. Now I trust Christ and Him alone and His Scriptures. It's a lonely place to be in the world, but for the first time in my life I have true liberty. I'll see you tomorrow. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder 
crossthborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossthborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthborder.org.